Hello, my name is Konstantin Lewis and I would like to introduce you to our lab's newest work on generalizing models of visual cortex. When we as neuroscientists talk about generalizing models of a specific, specific brain area, what we usually mean is that these models should contain some sort of representation that is generalizing over all the neurons in this area, in the optimal case, even between animals. Having such a representation would be of immense use for us because we could study the computations in this area. And we are here and I would like to use this talk in order to give you some approaches that could lead to representations that generalize well. Now there's already one very known uh, approach for this and it's called the task-driven transfer. Let's have a look at how this works. In the task-driven transfer we have is some visual data set that we use on a standard uh, network architecture like VGG16 and we train, train this representation with the visual data set. Now, what we do is we try to predict neural responses to an individual area with the representation that was trained on the visual data set. We cut the representation to a layer that we think is the best and we replace it with a readout that is then with a frozen code trained on the neural data itself. This way we predict the neural data. So far so good. Now, this approach has been proven to work really well with monkeys and is well discussed in the Amazon L 2016. However, there has been growing evidence that with mice it doesn't work so well. So what do we do now if we want to get, obtain these generalizing representations for mice? We propose the data-driven transfer. Let's have a look at how this works. And the data-driven transfer is actually quite similar. Again, we have some basic networks consisting of convolutional layers, which we label the core. Now, what is different is that we train the representation on neural data as well. This neural data now is used to, to predict another data set from a different mouse and different neurons, i.e. generalizing to a different, to different neurons. We replace the readout, freeze the core, and again train only the readout on the transfer data set. Okay, if we now use this and try to, to provide generalizing features, we compare this to a directly trained core. On the y-axis you see the performance, on the x-axis you see different amounts of data that we train our representation with. If you compare it to the direct training, and I only take one data set, we see that as predicted and as to be expected, in the low data regime, we are better than the direct training since we had only little data. But now in the, in the high data regime, we do not catch up with the direct training to representation. So far, so good. It did not work with one data set, so I think we have to take one step back. Let's think of some methods that could help us improve the yields that we get from our data for the data driven transfer. The methods that we could think of are twofold. We can improve and, and enlarge in our data sets by stitching data sets together, and we can make even better use of the data that we already have by being more efficient. In order to stitch data sets together, we look at the positions of the neurons in the cortex. Once we have these uh, positions, we can track the neurons over different sessions and, and scans, and can then later on concatenate the data sets together such that, we, such that we effectively gain combined data sets which are bigger. To be more efficient, let's remember that what we really want is the core, and the readout is just some help for us. So let's try to reduce the number of parameters in the readout such the, that the computation are pushed to the core and are taken best advantage of in the core. So we propose a different readout mechanism that then uh, reduces the number of parameters. For that, let's remember that the core consists of different convolutional layers. These layers have different uh, have features, which the readout then reads out from. So what we would try to do is that we, we map this, these uh, features to one scalar. This is the job of the readout. If we do this naively, uh, we can just do it fully connected, and we would arrive at some range of 10 to the power of 9 parameters. In the previous state of the art, the factorized readout, this actually shrinks down to 10 to the power of 7. So now what we propose is that we only look at one position in this feature space and extract the feature vector from this. We weigh it with a feature weight, uh, pass it through a nonlinearity and then get our, um, our new responses out of that. So far, so good. That's the problem here is finding this one position where we extract the feature vector. Let's look at this plane. If you want to find this position, what we propose is that we model it with a 2D Gaussian distribution. The covariance is then an exploration phase during the training quite big, and we sample our mean, our position from, from this uh, distribution. During training now, the covariance shrinks, and we are more and more sure where the position should be. For two neurons, this would look like that during training. 
If we do that, we end up with a number of parameters in the range of 10 to the power of 5. Now we have even a new, another invention for this readout. Remember that we have the cortical positions of our neurons. We can use these and making use of retinotopy, we can predict the, the positions where the neurons are, are looking at. Because retinotopy states that uh, neurons that are close together in, visual, in, in space and cortex also look at positions in visual space that are close together. Now we, are, we arrive at another reduction of a uh, number of parameters and our neurons can inform each other about where they should look, like, look at. Okay, we have these new methods. Let's test them on real experiments. The first question that we want to answer in experiments is how well our, our readout generally performs. For that, we look at the performance as a function of the dataset size again, and we compare it to the old previous state-of-the-art factorized readout. If we now look at the Gaussian readout, we see that it performs astonishingly well and actually outperforms the factorized readout in all data regimes. This is really good news, and if we look at that and, and check it for a lower number of neurons, we see that it's also consistent. We reach a 7% improvement to the state-of-the-art performance. Now we want to know if our readout actually does its job that we designed it for, namely if it gets generalizing features out of the core. Let's have a comparison again between the old and the new readout. If we look at the direct training, we see that the Gaussian readout is better. We already know that from the previous plot. Now, if you look at, at a training, at an experimental setup, where we always have the full data for the readout, but the core is trained on different amounts of data, we can see the following curve. If you compare that now to a setup where the core is always trained on the full data, but the readout only has different amounts of data, we see this. Now, I want to guide your attention to this gap in the Gaussian readout, which is not present in the factorized readout. It means that if, even if the readout has all, kind, all data it can have, it will never overtake the, the, the experiment where the core is trained on all um, data. That means that we have uh, successfully pushed the computations to the core and achieved generalizing features. Now that we know that our readout works, let's go to a real thing and let's try our representation on a different animal and see if it, if it generalizes. You already know this plot from our methods section. If we now stitch four data sets together, and uh, compare this performance, we see that we greatly outperform the direct performance. That means that not even do we catch up with it, we are actually better. We generalize better to the new data set than the, the direct training, which was trained directly on the data itself. Now we, we decided to go brute force and just put 11 data sets together without matching any new ones, just to see how high we can get. And as you can see, this doesn't give us that much more. So actually matching new ones and stitching data sets together seemed to help quite well. In order to compare with the task-driven approach, which I was introducing before, we also look at the VGG16 and we approve that um, it does not seem to work that well for mice. So what have we achieved so far? We see that our, uh, we have an improvement of 11% to the previous state-of-the-art performance. We also see that 33% improvement to the task-driven transfer um, is actually quite a, a good result. And we see that we are saving 40% of data, which makes us way more data efficient than the direct training approach. So we have successfully gained some generalizing representations of, of mouse visual cortex. If you're interested in our work, you can look at our GitHub page where we provide some code to use our representation on your own experiments. We also provide the data of our transfer data set so you can compare your own um, representations with ours and see which one generalizes better. Last but not least, I would also welcome you to join us at our poster session on my 4th from 1 to 3 a.m. PDT. Thank you very much.